All right. Well, hello and welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar entitled High Dimensional Flow Cytometric Characterization of Complex Tissues with Infinity Flow. My name is Jeff Jensen, and I'll be acting as your host for today's event. First off, we want to thank BioLegend for sponsoring this event. The good people over at BioLegend are always working to bring you fantastic content and exceptional products and services. They have some of the best antibody products available anywhere in the industry, and their website is chock full of useful articles, web tools, and much, much more. If you haven't already seen the content library at, on BioLegend's website, you definitely should head over to BioLegend.com and see how the information that they've put together can help you and your research. This webinar today is being hosted by FloraFinder. If you frequently use multi-parameter flow cytometry in your research, then you should get yourself familiar with FloraFinder, the gold standard of online panel design tools. More information can be found at florafinder.com. As a reminder, today's webinar uh, is a live event. There will be a question and answer period at the end, but please feel free to ask questions during the presentation by using the GoToWebinar control panel located on the right side of your screen. This webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be sent out to all registrants. Our presenter today will be um, Dr. Mark Headley. Uh, Dr. Headley is an assistant professor at the Fred Hutch uh, Clinical Research Division and an affiliate assistant professor in the Department of Immunology at University of Washington. Dr. Headley studies the cellular and molecular dynamics that underlie tumor metastasis, the spread of cancer cells from a primary tumor to distant organs. To enable these studies, his group has developed a suite of cutting edge tools, including intravital microscopy and high dimensional flow cytometry approaches like infinity flow, uh, which allow comprehensive exploration of the dynamic functions of cells in the context of disease. And Dr. Headley, if you're ready, I'm gonna pass you control of the screen so you can start your presentation. And that'll just take a second here to get that passed over to you. Thank you uh, for having me here today to discuss uh, what we think is a pretty pretty interesting and cool new method for, um, for high dimensional flow cytometry. Um, I'm assuming that our audience will be um, full of people who have a pretty strong appreciation of flow cytometry already. So I've, um, you'll pardon me if during the course of the talk I don't uh, go into extensive detail about the you know sort of underlying features of flow, um, but I'm happy to address any uh, anything that's unclear in the question and answer after the talk. Um, so yes, I am here today to tell you a bit about um, a method that um, myself and my collaborators, who I will um, introduce you to in a moment uh, in picture form. Uh, developed as a as a means of sort of getting at some of the underlying complexity in tissue marker environments in uh, animal models and in, in human patient samples um, and really trying to to understand how uh, cell phenotype um, uh, relates to the the functions of cells within diseases and, and development. So first, I always like to start off with acknowledgments. It's easy to to sweep the stuff under the rug at the end, and really these are the people who who matter the most in developing stuff. So these, these are my collaborators. Um, Etienne Becht, uh, shown there in the large picture, is a, is a truly brilliant uh, researcher who was a postdoc with uh, Evan Newell and Raphael Guitardo at various points. And, and really this, uh, this method is his brainchild. Um, and then this was also done in collaboration with the, the Genou lab. So um, moving on from there, uh, I just wanted to give a little bit of background about how we got interested in, uh, you know, what kind of questions drive my my group and why we got interested in, in this type of high dimensional flow cytometric profiling. Um, so as Jeff uh, mentioned at the top, um, the my lab really studies the process of tumor metastasis and we've had a long uh, running interest in, in this process in the lung, the lung being one of the most prevalent uh, sites uh, for tumor metastasis to target, um, metastasis being the spread of cancer from a primary tumor um, to a distal site, such as the lung. <clears throat> so that's really depicted here. You can see a primary tumor, in this case, a breast, uh, breast tumor, that tumor cells have escaped from that tumor, uh, traveled through the circulation in the bloodstream, and arrested in, in a new site, uh, the lung. And what's really driven a lot of the questions that we approach in the, in the my group 
is this idea that the immune system is a really central player in the process of metastasis. So um, through our work and, and many other fantastic researchers, um, it's become really clear that there are both immunologic elements that support metastasis, just like there are uh, immune cells that can support primary tumor growth. Um, and then also there are tumor cells that are actively trying to defend against, sorry, tumor cells, immune cells that are actively trying to defend against the metastatic process. So I've, I've sort of highlighted some of these here. Um, and, and really what we focus on is how does the encounter with tumor in the earliest moments of metastasis um, sort of change those local immune environments, change those immune cells, and how in turn do they uh, respond and impact the growth and survival of those tumor cells. So moving into high dimensional flow characterization. So we often depict these sort of complex intera interactions in these really simplistic forms, right? We say, okay, we have a tumor cell or a set of tumor cells that are growing in a tissue in the lung in this case. Um, and then there's these spattering of immune cells that all you know, sort of focus in on, on the tumor cell. Collectively, we would call these immune cells um, the tumor immune microenvironment. Um, the tumor itself, uh, metastatic tumors are made up of tumor cells, immune cells, uh, stromal cells, endothelial cells. There's a ton of diversity in the different cell types that um, are at play in, in these cancers. So um, as you might guess from that description, this would be a fairly simplistic view. And, and the reality is um, tissue and microenvironments of disease and, and even you know, normal healthy tissue are exceedingly complicated. There is tons of cross interaction between different types of immune cells, the structural cells of the tissue itself, and these things are all regulating, counter-regulating, responding to, and taking signals from each other. Um, and the tone of that, that whole um, sort of uh, dynamic process is what dictates the outcome of disease, or at least that's our, our perspective on it, is that really what we want to understand is not just what this one type of cell does, we want to understand how it influences all the cells around it and how those cells in turn influence it. And that's how we can really begin to understand um, the intricacies of, of these complex biological systems. So how do you do that? How do you understand uh, such a rich and diverse um, set of factors? And increasingly, the most popular answer in science is single cell analysis. So, so what does that mean? So um, basically what that entails is you take your tissue or your sample type of interest, so that could be you know, lung cells, it could be spleen cells, it could be bone marrow, it could be a patient blood sample, PBMCs from, from a patient. Um, and you know, first step is take that collection of cells and generate a single cell suspension. So relatively easy with a blood sample. For a tissue sample, that might involve digesting the tissue, dissecting it um, in various ways until you get this sort of uh, um, uh, single cell suspension. So once you have that, there are quite a number of different approaches at that, that hand that can allow you to pick apart what each of those cellular constituents are. So we will, of course, be talking about flow cytometry today, um, but you know, sort of a related technology, mass cytometry, and uh, then this whole suite of different technologies that are sort of collectively single cell sequencing technology. So those include single cell RNA sequencing, single cell attack seq for epigenomic uh, or chromatin accessibility um, mapping, and then uh, uh, sort of comparable um, technology, I guess, to what I'm gonna to present today, site seq, which actually allows you to use sequencing to map proteins on cells. Um, so I believe my next slide will kind of show some of the uh, pros and cons of these different methods. What I've, I've shown here, mostly these are all sort of focused on uh, assessing the proteins that make up these cells um, and define these cells. You can also, as I, I noted with the sequencing technologies, you can get transcriptomic data, epigenomic and uh, chromatin accessibility data um, that is incredibly useful in understanding the heterogeneity of these underlying systems. But we're going to focus on proteins. So if we kind of venture into the fold of single cell protein analysis, um, there's a suite of different tools that researchers now have at the ready for, um, for understanding at a single cell level, importantly, um, what proteins are expressed by cells and how those change in disease. Um, but each of these methods has some strengths and weaknesses. So if you look at conventional flow cytometry, um, Generally speaking, so you can get up to around 28 parameters with some of the more advanced cytometers out there. Um, 
maybe even a little bit beyond that if you're really um, clever. But most panels, most standard panels, uh, top out at about 20 different parameters. So that's uh, you know, 20 different proteins that you're looking at um, on your cells of interest. Um, but a real strength of this uh, technology is that your cell throughput is exceptionally high. So you can, in a single assay, uh, if you take the time to do so, you can look at tens of millions of cells. And um, what that means is that you know, not all cells are equally plentiful in these rich tissues. So, and, and it, just because you're rare doesn't mean you're not important to the overall process. So this has um, been very clearly demonstrated with cell types like innate lymphocytes, ILCs, that, um, you know, are exceedingly sparse in tissues, but really drive a lot of the disease response and the you know, sort of flexibility to environment that, that tissues have. Um, so being able to profile you know, huge numbers of cells allows you to kind of get at some of those rarer populations and understand them. And then the other big advantage of conventional flow cytometry is it's a technology that's been around for quite a long time at this point and is really highly available at almost every you know, major research institution. And, and you know, there's a huge range of different types of instruments that range from you know incredibly expensive to, to very, um, well, relatively very inexpensive. Um, which has just made the, the accessibility of that technology quite high. Kind of a new kid on the block, spectral flow cytometry um, is really operating in the same space as conventional flow cytometry, but by using spectral mapping and uh, deconvolution of uh, the fluorescent molecules that are labeling your proteins through uh, antibody labeling, um, you can kind of up that number of parameters to you know, 30 or 40 or, or, or I think beyond as this technology increases. Um, and again, you have this incredible cell throughput. Uh, availability is still pretty low on this, so that is rapidly changing. Um, I will note that uh, for the method I'm going to talk about today, Infinity Flow, um, it would be uh, equally achievable with conventional flow or spectral flow. And we've actually done uh, used both types of technologies in, uh, in the approach. Um, Next, we have mass cytometry, which I already mentioned briefly. This is using uh, metal labeled antibodies and uh, uh, mass spectrometry to, uh, to assess protein expression. So you get a bit higher um, parameter space. You don't have to deal with things like spectral overlap, um, but your cell throughput is, is a bit lower. So it's still quite high, hundreds of thousands of cells generally, um, or with a lot of effort, you could get up into the millions probably. Um, but intrinsically a bit of a slower um, approach, so a little lower throughput. Um, and then we have things like uh, these sequencing-based technologies, so using uh, barcoded uh, oligotagged antibodies to detect proteins on cells, um, and then combining that in with a uh, transcriptomic analysis or something of that nature um, using uh, approaches like SiteSeq or ReefSeq or AppSeq in general. So this is an incredibly <laughs> cool technology and that and I think there's a lot of excitement around it and that really your number of parameters you can look at number of proteins per cell is, is, is hundreds there's no real clear limit at this point it's just a matter of cost how many antibodies you want to throw at the at the equation um, and you also get this tandem transcriptomic information which is pretty amazing uh, the real limit here is cell throughput um, and cost so um, in any average experiment, you're really only looking at tens of thousands of cells um, at most, and uh, your sampling of those cells can be pretty sparse as well. Like you don't get, um, you get a lot of different parameters, but you maybe don't get a huge amount of depth on each cell. Um, the availability of these is increasing, but it's still um, quite a bit lower than conventional flow cytometry. And then perhaps um, even a bit further down the list with maybe some of the highest potential is single cell mass spectrometry. This would be really true unbiased analysis of every protein that a cell does. And there's a few methods out there, including scope MS that allow you to do this. Um, current cell throughput is in the hundreds of cells. So if you're really trying to look at a, a really complex um, tissue, um, you know, being able to play in this space where you're looking at, you know, potentially almost all of the cells of that tissue, um, depending on the, the, the you know, type of tissue we're talking about, um, gives you a huge advantage in the type of diversity that you can map, right? So if you're going to come down here into the more sequencing-based approach or single cell mass spectrometry, um, you're probably looking at having to do an upfront enrichment scheme or something of that to really focus in on the cells you care about, which adds a little bit of um, complexity and bias to those approaches um, and also expense. 
So what we have asked ourselves um, in developing Infinity Flow is, can we basically leverage all these strengths, you know, high parameter um, analysis, high cell throughput, high accessibility, low cost, um, while minimizing the weaknesses? And um, can we use sort of a computational approach to achieve that? Which brings us to Infinity Flow. So Infinity Flow, as I mentioned, was um, really the brainchild of, of Etienne Becht and uh, sort of represents a, a really nice merging of um, highly you know, well-established technology, flow cytometry, and, and implemented in a fairly conventional way, I will say, um, and a quite cutting edge computational approach using machine learning to um, really pull as much information out of, a, out of a relatively standard flow cytometry experiment as you can. So the way this approach works, um, we are not the only to call it this, but we generally speak of these as sort of massively parallel flow cytometry experiments. Um, so the basic idea is you have a big collection of cells. So this would be your tens of millions of lung cells or your tens of millions of blood cells or spleen cells or liver cells, what have you. So you're going to stain all of those cells at the same time, same tube, with a, a backbone panel, a set of backbone markers. So this would be really um, what we think of when we think of a conventional flow cytometry panel, right? This is going to um, label specific cell populations of interest, like maybe we want to look at T cells and B cells and monocytes and neutrophils. So we'd have antibodies to look at those specific populations present within this backbone. So importantly, every cell in your entire assay stained with that same backbone, same time, same way, et cetera. So there's some uh, parity basically across all your cells. You're then going to take that, split it up into a, um, a subsamples, right? You're going to plate those onto a 96 well plate like this. So each of these wells in this 96 well plate as designed um, contain a different antibody. So now you have a collection of cells that have all of the same backbone markers stained on them. You're detecting all those proteins in tandem. Um, and then each of these wells has a unique antibody. We, we term this just because it's fun, the infinity panel. Um, but I think one important uh, piece here is that these are commercially available kits. So BioLegend has been selling um, this Legend Stream kit. There, there are other versions of this type of idea on the market. Um, and because it's sort of this prepackaged kit, this is one of the areas where we can uh, minimize costs, right? Um, it's a, it ends up being quite inexpensive to get one of these uh, these plate kits, and you have uh, you know 200 plus, 300 plus uh, individual markers that you can assess across your sample. Okay, so now after you've done all that, you basically have a setup like this. You have whatever your backbone panel is stained on every single cell and every single well. And then you'll have a, sort of a sparse matrix of uh, individual exploratory markers or infinity markers that are stained across each well separately. <clears throat> so you then acquire all that data um, using a conventional flow cytometer. Um, and really any cytometer will do as long as it's sufficient to deal with the level of backbone panel you've designed, right? So if you have a 15 color backbone panel, you need to be able to deal with that on your cytometer. But you could do this type of work with you know, a four color panel if, if you're um, really focused in on an individual population or something of that nature. So then the quote unquote magic happens, right? So you take that relatively conventional assay, um, still pretty cool assay, I would say, um, that we had no part in designing, but um, uh, relatively conventional. And then you funnel this through uh, the Infinity Flow computational pipeline. <clears throat> so the way this works um, and how you can visualize it is if you look at each cell, basically, um, you have these densely measured um, backbone markers, right? So I already mentioned that every backbone marker is assessed on every single cell in the assay. And then you have this sparse matrix of the Infinity markers where um, you know, if this is well one, you only have that data in that well um, and not in any of the other wells. And then the same is true for each of the um, individual markers in your panel. So what we can then do, because the backbone markers are measured across the whole data set, is we can use nonlinear regression and machine learning to establish relationships in the data between each backbone marker and the infinity markers. So the important bit here is this sort of nonlinear aspect to this. So this takes into account every aspect of your stain. You're getting information from all of the backbone markers and their expression um, patterns across each individual single cell. Um, you know, we're kind of showing individual cells here as dots. 
and also the continuum of expression. So you're not binarizing your data. You're not saying, hey, this is a high cell, and this is a low cell, this is a negative cell. We're looking at the full spectrum of um, that staining pattern, right? Which tells you a lot about how much of that protein is actually expressed on your cell and things of that nature. So drawing those um, relationships or revealing those relationships between the different backbone markers and your exploratory markers, so your infinity markers, allows you to then go through a machine learning based imputation process where we then cross predict each individual marker across the rest of the data set, right? So now, um, whereas before we only had measured, say, this uh, yellow marker on well one, we're going to impute its expression on well two on the cells of that well and, and better understand the co-expression of the marker that we empirically stained in well one and, and well two. Um, so what you get out of the uh, end of the pipeline is you get this augmented data matrix, which is basically now we've filled in all the blanks. And I'll show you um, an example of that in a slightly different way and how that looks. So um, this is basically what this type of data looks like. Uh, we're looking at um, a smaller subset of, of these markers, 10 markers, um, and basically 100 cells per marker that we've, that we've sampled. So <clears throat> if you look across the top here, we're showing the staining patterns in the backbone. And hopefully what will come to the fore is if you look at a well-designed backbone panel, there will be patterns in here, right? So you have cells that will sort of stain brightly for MAC class two or CD4, and there will be you know different expression patterns across all your backbones. So that that's what the backbone panel is bringing to the equation. It's revealing that sort of underlying population structure in your data. And then if you look at the actual empirical measurements of each of the exploratory markers, the infinity panel, um, you can see that you know we do have measurements across every. Um, sort of cluster within the backbone, um, but not for every marker, for every well, for every cell. Um, so you can kind of see uh, patterns emerge there as well. And so then the nonlinear regression-based approach takes those patterns that have emerged from both of the uh, those data sets and it merges them and imputes them and cross predicts so that you end up with this replete um, data set where we can now you know, visualize um, expression and co-expression of all these different markers across every single cell in the assay. So I'll spend just a moment on this, but I want to, that's a lot to digest and I wanted to give a, a much more simple example. Um, so for those who are really computationally savvy, um, I will preface up front that the math underlying this is, is not quite as I have it depicted here, but I think conceptually this is pretty helpful. So if you imagined a hypothetical diverse sample that was limited to three different cell types, B cells, neutrophils, and T cells, and you had a backbone panel that was just three markers, one each for those cells. <clears throat> if you use dimensionality reduction algorithms, which wouldn't work super well in such a limited data set, but concept uh, should work. And uh, I'm not gonna go into this, but uh, if you're not familiar with UMAP and TISNI and, and such, uh, this is sort of a key element how you visualize these large, large uh, high dimensional data sets. Um, so in this, what we would call UMAP space, if we take all the data from those three backbone markers, what you would end up seeing is that population sort of assort into their uh, defined regions in, in UMAP space. Um, so we have our neutrophils over here and our T cells and our B cells. Okay, so each cell has an address, you might say, in UMAP space, which um, is dictated by the unique spectrum of backbone panel markers that, that state those cells. So then when we expand that out to uh, the infinity flow assay, um, so now we have those backbone stained uh, hypothetical cells um, plated out across these different wells with different markers in each well. And this is where you can start to see the patterning, right? So if we have something this simple where we have T cells, B cells, and neutrophils, you know, our, a portion of our T cells are staining with CD4, our B cells stain with MHC class two, um, C11B is on the neutrophils, maybe on a small subset of the B cells, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so by knowing those relationships between uh, the backbone markers and how those cells are placed in the UMAP, we basically are able to predict the expression of the other, of the other markers across those cells, <clears throat> like I've shown here. So I do want to emphasize this is not exactly how it's working mathematically, um, but the same kind of factors are, piecing, are, are at play, right? So when you're using UMAP to 
uh, reduce the dimension to your data set so we could visualize it on a two-dimensional plot, you're using a similar kind of concept of trying to understand the relationship of those uh, those markers of the backbone to place them on this UMAP space. Um, and we leverage that same underlying information to do the imputation. Okay, so let's look at an actual experiment. Um, so this is a, a study we did using uh, murine lung cell cells. So basically um, isolated lungs from all type C57 black six mice. Uh, prepared our single cell uh, digest and stained with our backbone panel, which I will show you down here below. Um, and then we ran uh, this in our infinity flow assay. Um, so uh, this is our panel. So this was a standard sort of 15 color lung immunoprofiling panel. And we ran this on a uh, what is now a fairly common uh, uh, type of instrument, a Fortessa X20, though um, I believe uh, the you know, we're now in the world where we have symphonies and, and other instruments of that nature. Um, so it's a relatively uh, uh, simple panel, just uh, some markers of T cells, some markers of different myeloid cell lineages, um, a big kind of combo channel that works really nicely in this infinity flow assay where we um, have different markers of, of uh, kind of discrete immune subsets. And uh, importantly, I'm not really going to emphasize this today, but um, those markers all stay with different intensity, even though they're all stayed with the same fluorophor. So you get some information about which cells are, are present in that lineage channel um, from that data. And the, the infinity flow algorithm can make use of that information. So if we were dealing with this in what I sometimes tongue in cheek call finite flow or kind of standard flow, um, you would take that, those stained cells, um, and you'd go through a conventional flow gating scheme. So, you know, sort of sequential uh, binarizing of your data. You collect, hey, these are positive for this. Let's go look at what they're positive for the next. Um, and not to disparage that, because that's, I do this all the time, and we all do. Um, and it can be incredibly useful for sort of uh, robust delineation of populations. But obviously, you can see along the way, we lose a lot of different cells that we're just not accounting for. Um, in our gating scheme. So if you were to look at what all we would account for conventionally in our backbone panel um, and plot that over uh, a UMAP of that data that's run just on the backbone markers, um, you can see we're missing a ton of information, right? We have these whole huge clusters of cells that we're just really not dealing with um, accounting for, even though, um, as you can tell by the fact that they cluster um, within the UMAP space, the backbone panel is actually defining um, heterogeneity in these cells that we're not able to um, discern easily with conventional gating strategies. So in contrast, if we run this whole thing through uh, the infinity flow pipeline, um, we get all this extra data. So this is just showing a subset of these several hundred markers that, that we analyzed. Um, and we've basically taken the output of the infinity flow pipeline. We've run a clustering algorithm on it. That's phenograph as shown here. Um, and then we're showing the expression, not at the single cell level, we're showing it at the cluster level, um, but we can use that information uh, to delve into the infinity flow um, data and actually define each of these individual cell populations. So this is a relatively um, exhaustive analysis of a steady state murine lung that was achieved with 15 color flow cytometry. You know, it's a lot more parameters we're looking at, but it's, it's 15 color flow. And we can see everything from you know, the tissue resident alveolar macrophages, um, multiple distinct monocyte populations, multiple dendritic cell populations, neutrophils, basophils, eosinophils, um, some pretty nice diversity in the non-immune cells of, of the lung, um, and then a, a, a nice delineation of different lymphocyte subsets. Again, all with a, a relatively basic uh, backbone panel. So importantly, this approach is not limited just to subsetting cells. It, yeah, for the immunologists in the audience, we love to subset. Um, this T cell is this type of T cell, this monocyte is this type of monocyte. Um, but we also really want to understand what the different proteins that are expressed by these cells and what they can tell us about the function of those cells. So um, taking that data, we can go back into sort of the bivariate space that most of us are used to with flow cytometry analysis. Um, and we can look at all these different markers now across every cell and ask, you know, what are uh, the expression patterns and co-expression patterns of these different things. So folate receptor 4 with TCR beta or a B cell marker with a T cell marker or TIM3 on CD103 positive dendritic cells like we're showing here. And there's a, just a ton of potential for interrogating this data in, uh, in various ways, standard and, and 
in more computationally uh, savvy ways. <clears throat> so what you really end up with when you run an assay like this is uh, the potential to do co-expression analysis on tens of millions of cells, of uh, diverse cells, um, across hundreds of parameters. Um, there's really no, no limit as long as you're willing to take the time to run another well on your plate and you have a high quality antibody to measure a protein, you can add it to an assay like this and you can uh, get you know, truly a tremendous amount of data. Um, and importantly, on the single cell level. So you know, each of these dots of these, uh, these UMAPs are a single cell. We're measuring each of those, well, imputing each of those hundreds of parameters across every cell and getting a, uh, what we believe is a fairly accurate representation of the actual expression or measured expression. So one of the, I think, unexpected things that we found when we were um, developing uh, sort of the computation behind this approach is that actually the, it's not as simple as um, everything kind of ties back one-to-one -to, -one to a single element of the backbone panel. So when you run UMAP on just your backbone, you get a certain sort of structure to your populations, as you can see here. Um, this is showing sort of, again, the whole lung. Um, and then on the right, we have a cluster of B cells. And I'll play a little movie here, which hopefully we'll, we'll play on the webinar, um, where we're basically going from the base state on the backbone to a UMAP that we've now run on across the entirety of the augmented data matrix with infinity flow. And a, a couple of really cool things come out of this because we're using these sort of nonlinear approaches, um, patterns that were not as apparent in the underlying backbone start to emerge. So one of them um, in our backbone panel, CDC ones, a particular type of dendritic cell, really stains with a lot of similar markers to B cells, even though they're really quite distinct cells, but by leveraging the differences that are present in the backbone and then using all this additional information we get from the infinity panel the algorithms are able to derive that actually those cells are really highly related to the cdc2s another type of dendritic cell um, maybe similarly a little more subtly if we zoom in on this b cell cluster we actually start to see intraclusteral heterogeneity show up so within uh, the sort of single cluster of B cells, we can see different populations that express sort of different markers of B cell uh, differentiation and, and, and subtype, uh, IgD, CD21, and CD43. And so as you merge into this uh, augmented space with the infinity flow matrix, those populations um, come to the fore. And I'm not going to show this data, but you can go back in in a new experiment, you know, separate experiment, and validate this. And, uh, we've had a, a lot of success validating the predictions that you would make from the infinity flow data. So I'll spend a little time next in the time we have remaining kind of talking about how you can implement this approach in your own lab. Um, but first, um, I think we've at least made a really nice step in the right direction towards um, sort of increasing or leveraging the strengths of, of these uh, protein-based uh, approaches, flow cytometry based approaches predominantly, um, while minimizing some of those limits. So uh, with Infinity Flow, you really are able to look at hundreds of parameters in tandem. As I said, there's really the only limits are how many antibodies you have that are good and how much time you have to run your plates. Uh, we can easily um, do this analysis across tens of millions of cells um, and the availability of the, you know, the underlying technology and the reagents needed is, is really quite high. Um, Okay. <clears throat> so I don't want to make everything seem perfectly rosy. There are obviously limitations to this approach. Uh, perhaps the, the primary one is this is an imputation based approach, right? So um, we're taking empirical measurement. That is a strength. We actually have measured every, every marker that, that is being predicted. It's not um, made up data as it were. Um, but then those individual measurements across cells we are imputing and predicting. So um, it's really essential, whatever you take from your um, initial foray into an approach like this, that you go in and you validate and you cross-validate and you make sure um, that what you're seeing is real. But that said, as I mentioned, in our experience, um, it's been really robust, robust and, um, with a well-designed assay. You can take a lot of information out of these, these experiments. Um, so more uh, technical features. So if a marker in the infinity assay, if their expression is sort of completely independent from any parameter in the backbone, you're not going to have any success imputing that. I'll show you an example of that in a moment. 
Um, so really the backbone has to be informative for the markers that you're trying to predict. Um, it does take quite a number of cells, so we're splitting a single sample across several hundred wells, and you need, from a technical perspective, enough cells in that well to actually collect those cells at the back end. Um, and then in the data, you have to have representatives from any cell type that you care about that you're trying to analyze within each well. Um, so uh, cell number is, is, a, is a concern. If you have a really limited pool of cells, you're, you're going to have a hard time running the full assay, so you could run a truncated version of it pretty easily. Um, background staining becomes a bit of a problem because we have such a huge data set and um, as anybody who does flow cytometry knows, uh, autofluorescence and just, you know, stickiness and FC receptor-based stickiness of antibodies can be a real problem. Um, we, I'm not really going to talk about this, but we have built a, a background correction approach into the Infinity Flow pipeline that takes advantage of the fact that, um, at least in the commercially available assays, the, all the isotypes um, of the different antibodies are available to us so we can actually um, use that to better uh, map the true expression um, or the true staining. Um, and then this is an aspect of design, but you have to be really careful about saturating uh, channels with the, particularly in the uh, infinity flow channel, which usually is in PE and very bright. You have a huge dynamic range of staining, um, and if anything kind of goes off axis uh, uh, in your collection of the data, it can lead to a lot of um, problems in compensation and things of that nature that'll lead to uh, false positives or biologically inaccurate predictions. So those are all things you can deal with, um, fortunately. So <clears throat> implementing Infinity Flow in your own work, how would you go about doing this? So step one, you have to design an effective backbone panel. So, so what are the things you should be thinking about in doing such a thing? Um, so the first thing is, what's your question? Are you trying to take a largely unbiased um, analysis of the entirety of a tissue like I showed sort of earlier with our profiling of the lung? Um, or is it that you're really interested in a particular subset of cells and you want to do a really in-depth analysis of that subset? So both are totally feasible with this approach, um, and it's really just how you design your backbone to capture the underlying elements of those populations um, that you might be interested in interrogating. Um, so you do have to be really careful that the populations that you care about are reflected in the backbone. Um, otherwise, you will not generate high quality predictions with infinite flow. So a really clear example of this, um, if you're looking at T cell subsets, um, in an earlier version of, of the commercial legend screen panel, they had these TCR spectra typing antibodies, or I don't think they're in the current version of that, uh, of the assay. But um, regardless, if you um, have, say, markers of T cells generically in your backbone, which we did, um, you can identify those cells that should, you know, stay with different V betas or V alphas. And so here, what I'm showing is the measured. So we're getting good staining, um, good detection of individual T cells that have those uh, TCRs. But because those T cells within our backbone just look like T cells, they don't look like a V beta 13 T cell specifically in that steady state, at least. Uh, the imputation just doesn't do a good job. We catch a little bit of it, but we're we're missing most of those cells. So if you were concerned with an individual clone, uh, you just have to be sure to build that stuff into your backbone or if a, you know, a specific type of T cell or something that can all be built into the backbone. Um, so simplify within reason. So the more markers in your backbone, it seems like more the better, right? But it's not necessarily the case. So yes, the more you throw in your backbone, the better you will potentially be able to delineate the underlying population structure that you're interested in. So more different cell types um, distinctly uh, delineated or more types of T cells or something of that nature, right? Um, however, this is still fluorescence-based flow cytometry and you have to consider things like spillover spread and, and your compensation. So if you generate a, a truly complex panel, um, all of those downstream considerations also come into play and you have to be quite careful um, about how you set up your assay. So to set that home a little bit more, compensation, spillover, those those elements all still matter. So a really cool thing about Infinity Flow is that all of your parameters, your imputed parameters are measured in the same channel, right? Say PE, which is, is usually what we do. Um, so you actually normalize a lot of the uh, variability you might have by using different fluorophores for different markers. But you have to be very careful that when you design your backbone that you're not getting a ton of spread into or out of, um, of that Infinity Flow channel, that PE channel, let's say. Um, Otherwise, it could impact the quality of the imputation. So again, this is just a design thing. You just have to be aware of this stuff as you design your panel. 
So showing an example of what saturation can do, um, um, you have to you know, be really careful how you set your voltages for your, particularly for your infinity flow channel. There's a huge range in positives and negatives in the P channel because you're staining you know, hundreds of different markers. Um, and this is just a fact of flow cytometry. If you saturate your detector, if you go past sort of the dynamic range of the detection, uh, your compensation will just go all over the place. And so um, in a poorly designed assay, which is I'm showing here something, you know, before we kind of cleaned everything up um, and uh, you know, perfected the method, I guess, <clears throat> that these sort of trailing uh, really bright PE parameters, they generate predictions and those predictions are based on real data. Uh, you know, they're accurate, but they're not biologically relevant because they are a byproduct of, of a compensation artifact. So um, just to, you still have to do good flow cytometry, I guess is the, is the point. Um, so step two, test your backbone panel. So we like to do this using what we call a mini infinity experiment. So basically we stain ourselves with our full test backbone, the, the panel we're developing. <clears throat> we split those into a truncated data set. So it might be five or 10 individual markers in state of PE, they include your controls. You want your FMO, your blank and your isotypes um, as well. So you can interpret everything properly. Um, then we collect that data on our cytometer and run everything through the pipeline. So the pipeline is completely scalable. You can do this with 10 markers, five markers, 100 markers, 200 markers, 1,000 markers, doesn't really matter. It'll treat it the same way. Um, and so you can run the pipeline, analyze that data, assess uh, whether you're capturing the populations you want to in your backbone, whether there's any uh, staining issues, compensation issues, et cetera, and really develop that out. Um, and then iterate until you get a panel that you're really happy with. So this doesn't have to be a terribly long process. It can take, um, you know, one experiment to feel like, hey, we have what we need, or it could take you know, 10. It just really depends on what you're trying to achieve. Um, but it saves you from going into that much more labor intensive full infinity flow assay. So then once you have your panel, your backbone panel, you're happy with it, run your assay, just like I showed before. Um, and I'm not going to go into the specifics, both due to time and complexity, um, of how to run the pipeline. But I will say, uh, so we posted all the necessary information that you need in, in at least two places. Uh, Etienne's uh, GitHub here, or there's a bio bioconductor page for this as well. Um, and importantly, there are step-by-step -step vignettes for every feature of running of running the pipeline. And I will say, my forte is not computation. I am a you know, cell immunologist by um, by training, um, and I can run this pipeline just fine. It's it's really a, a very simple package to implement as long as you have just a little basic computational skill. Um, but you do need to dig into those vignettes to kind of understand what's going on under the hood. Um, so once you have your data, the next step is to ask your questions of it, interrogate it. So one of the really cool things about um, how the pipeline was designed is, so it'll output a PDF with every parameter, um, you know, kind of displayed in UMAP space uh, across all your cells. You can kind of get this really broad look at your data, like I showed that, you know, huge mosaic of different parameters earlier. Um, but it also spits out a conventional flow file. So you get flow files for each well, you can concatenate those into one kind of um, uniform experiment, and you could analyze that in the same way you analyze any standard flow cytometry experiment. So you can do bivariate gating, you can um, do sequential gating, et cetera, but now instead of you know, 10, 15 markers, you have hundreds uh, at your disposal. Um, and further, because of the, that format is in a very conventional format, you can apply any of the more advanced computational approaches you might want to do. So within you know, standard flow uh, analysis software like Flojo, there are plugins that let you do additional U-mapping or phenograph clustering or uh, TISNI or FlowSOM or all these different approaches. Those all work on this data. You can use all that. It's also amenable to anything you can do in R with flow data. So using packages like FlowCore to, um, to access the underlying data and run uh, through any sort of uh, standard clustering algorithm, et cetera. So it's, it's incredibly flexible. Um, if you know how to do flow, you can analyze your data in a, in a similar and really powerful way. So I think we're just about at time. Um, to wrap this up, I just want to acknowledge um, my collaborators one last time. Um, it's really been uh, a ton of fun to, to work on this method and a, a lot of work came from from sort of all sides and getting it. And I really truly hope that um, as many people who are interested can uh, access the, the pipeline and, and start uh, uh, making use of this in their own experiments. And I would love to hear from people who are doing so and, and uh, 
uh, Nikki Smith. So thank you and uh, happy to take any questions. And if you want some examples of Infinity Flow in action, uh, I've listed a few papers that have used it in the primary literature and then um, a bioarchive preprint of our um, entire method and, uh, for some additional depth and detail if you would like it. Wow, Dr. Headley, thank you so much for the information. I, I, it's, it's my head is just spinning. It's amazing just when you see all these new machines and new antibody products coming out, and you think you can't possibly expand the horizons any farther. You come along with something like this, and it just opens up a whole new world of thing, of possibilities to look at. So I know I have lots of questions. I'm sure a lot of the attendees here are going to have questions too. Let me get this screen adjusted, and we can switch uh, right into the question and answer session. Give me just one second here to do that. Wonderful, looking forward to it. Okay, and let's see. We did get a lot of questions um, so far. We've got well over a dozen questions. So I can go through and start kind of reading those off to you. And uh, I'm, I'm sure, oh yeah, we're getting a ton more right now. So um, the first dozen or so, let me start kind of going through those. And um, I'll just kind of take them in the order we got them. And then, um, and then we can always adjust from there, depending on how much time you have, Dr. Headley, to, to take questions. So we'll just adjust. Okay. Um, yeah, I've got about, you know, up, up until the, the scheduled time of, of ending, I think we can get through most of these. And then, uh, right. yeah, we'll see where we get to. And I forwarded a lot of them to you um, just, just a second ago here as they came in. So the first one was, uh, ha have you tried uh, to barcode multiplex samples from different donors in addition to the backbone sample? Yeah, uh, this is a great question. Uh, we have, uh, so we haven't put anything out on that as yet, but um, barcoding does work. There are considerations you want, um, if you're going to include uh, sort of like, let's say CD45 in colors to barcode across different patients, uh, you just have to really make sure those channels are really well isolated um, because you don't want you know, that fluorescence information to be sort of adversely impacting the, the imputation across your different patients and giving you kind of different results just because of uh, the barcode. Um, so with that caveat in fluorescence, you know, it's never fully independent, right? There's always kind of bleed over and, and overlap, but if you have a well-separated channel, good compensation, it works quite well. We've, we've managed up to 10 different patients in a single sample using kind of a, a combinatorial barcoding scheme. Um, and yeah, more more to come on that, I, I would say. Great, and then Lucas, uh, same same person also asking, um, Lucas Black here asking, is a deep backbone better than a broad backbone? Uh, it really depends on the question that you're trying to get scientifically. So um, a, if your goal is to kind of get a pretty general sense of what is happening um, across the whole makeup of a particular tissue, uh, then I would say a broad backbone is better. Um, you will lose some resolution at the individual population level, right? I, I mentioned that aspect of, you know, TCR spectra typing. And, you know, so if, if you don't have delineation of the heterogeneity at some level in the backbone, um, you know, the, the method is not magic. It, it cannot work with what is not there. Uh, but if you're question is about T-cells and T-cell responses, designing a deep panel that gets you a lot of different T-cell subsets, et cetera, um, works fantastically well. And then you get the benefit of all these additional markers uh, to kind of examine the response of those cells. So uh, both are good, really just depends on what you're trying to do experimentally. Great, thanks. Okay, and we got a comment from Wade here. Wade noticed that you have a backbone marker that is also in the infinity panel. Is this a problem? Uh, it is not a problem, and actually, for the almost <laughs> most part, because the affinity panels are so uh, expansive, uh, I'm pretty sure for that data I showed that every single one of those backbone markers actually has its place in the affinity panel. Um, so that doesn't it, it it's not a bad thing actually. So the um, the one it can be a sanity check, right? If you don't do a good job imputing data that is actually measured, right? You're just imputing it into a different channel. Um, that would be a bad sign. So we find that that's um, pretty much one-to-one -one in, in any uh, setting that we've let. Um, the dynamic range sometimes of the PE, like if you're using PE for your infinity channel, actually sometimes can give you a slightly better signal than uh, what's in your backbone for particular markers. Um, and it does 
adversely influence the, the prediction on other things. So uh, you could exclude them, but with those commercial kits, it's just they're comprehensive enough that it's um, it's going to happen. Great. Okay. And then we had, uh, let's see, several people asked questions related to this. Maya Fideli, I think, was the first one. She asked how many cells are contained in each subsample after the staining with the backbone markers. But we also had other people asking how many cells are required in each, how many cells are required in each cell and how many are required overall for the full experiment. So if you can maybe just talk about that a little bit. Yeah, these are probably the most common questions we get. So um, I think by, it, there's a lot of different potential answers to this question. So as far as how many cells are in each subsample, um, there's a, quite a bit of flexibility. So I think with the BioLegend kit, they recommend between 100,000 and 750,000 cells per well. Um, uh, but uh, we've moved both up and down from that successfully. Um, it really just depends on what you have to work with. And on the low end, it's really a, more of a technical limit of doing you know, all the staining and such. So if you put 10,000 cells in a well, then you try to go through the whole staining protocol start to finish, you're going to not end up with a whole lot at the end, right? So usually we recommend... Uh, at least 250,000 um, to start with per well. Um, we've we've gotten by with with fewer if need to. And one way you can circumvent that technical aspect is that multiplexing is being very much earlier. So um, if you're in a situation where you have um, lower numbers of cells per sample, multiplexing together can give you enough technical you know cells in the well to actually do the do the method um, as far as how many you need to do good imputation uh, that's an interesting uh, it's an interesting so we actually have found um, the the as I mentioned um, sort of at the tail end of the talk there somewhat in the limitations um, part uh, the you have to have representation of each cell that you care about in each well right if you they don't have a basophil in well one, but you do in well two, you will not properly impute information on that basophil from well one. Just it's impossible. So, um, so you do have to consider that the rare populations you want to look at. Um, you might need to have more cells total in your well so that those are represented. We usually, you know, we've we've actually found using basophils as an example that as few as five basophils per well gave us pretty good predictions and imputations that those are basophils but you lose a lot of the heterogeneity of those populations you know so somewhere in the 30 to 100 of each cell type you care about is a, really a good rule of thumb um so i think i saw one of the questions asked about you know cell populations that are less than 0.5 percent we've gotten down to less than 0.03 um, for some populations and gotten uh achieved really great quality data that was reproducible and validatable um, in subsequent experiments, but we had to put more cells in, collect more cells to, to see those events. So um, there are finite limits, um, but you can work around them. If you really are concerned about something super rare, um, you might have to uh, go in with some sort of enrichment strategy to, to make sure that you have enough cells in each well. Um, as far as total cells you need for the assay, if you want to run the full, you know, for mouse, it's above 250 markers. For human, it's above 300 markers, 350 markers. You know, you need to have that many cells per well. Um, so the nice thing is the the parameter is scalable. So, sorry, the pipeline is scalable. So you can um, run a par partial assay. You can run these kind of mini infinity assays if you have fewer cells and uh, do something a little bit more curated. Um, but in the end, you need enough cells to go across all samples, either from one patient, one sample, or from a multiplex. Hopefully that answers all of the variants of that. I think, yeah, I think it does. Thank you so much. We have uh, a few more questions, and then I think we still have four or five minutes left in the hour or so, and we still have 250 people online, so let's keep going. Um, Glenn okay. Van Hurst asked, uh, is there a specific reason for including FSCH and FSCW for inputting instead of FSCA? Uh, not a specific reason. So we generally avoid including um, all three, you know, so FSC area hyphen width or side scatter area hyphen width, just because area is a, you know, derivation of, of height and width. Um, so we just kind of default to using the, the, uh, the width and height because um, that captures the information from the area um, and does a slightly better job of uh, delineating some of the, so we pre-gate out uh, doublets, 
but it's never perfect, right? And and this stuff, so it gives you a slightly better chance of seeing that stuff. I did see one other question of what you forwarded over, Jeff, that asked, uh, does it make does the pipeline make use of that data? Absolutely, it does. So um, the it's one of the cool things about what Etienne came up with is that those scatter parameters that tell you, you know, proportionality to size or granularity. There's a lot of information contained in that. Um, that scatter um, in those channels and the pipeline absolutely can make use of it. So if you're thinking about human PBMCs where you might have your, you know, granular sites, eosinophils, neutrophils, et cetera, being sort of higher up inside scatter, uh, the pipeline will take that into account and in how it sees those and, and imputes data. So yeah, it's absolutely valuable information. Okay, great. And then I've, I've got another question. I'm, I don't know if you can see this one from Iris Mayer. Um, we're going to try to I'm going to try to ask it and then see if it may be too detailed and we might have to get back to it on email but let's see where we go with this one uh, when inferring the inspection of every um, of every marker on every cell how does the algorithm know which infinity markers are co-expressed or not on a specific cell subset for example if klrg1 were expressed on well one and 50 percent of tregs and st2 were expressed on 50 percent of tregs um, then how is it determined whether that would be the same 50% of TREG expressed on both or if the markers are being mutually exclusive? Does that make sense to you? Yeah, great. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So that is a great question. And as I said, um, in the limitations uh, kind of discussion, that is a limit. If the, so for the algorithm to do that properly, um, you need to um, have that distribution reflected at some level in the backbone. So the the really interesting thing, and you know, this is not something I can point to, this is exactly how this works, because it's, you know, these these machine learning based approaches and nonlinear based approaches. Um, but because of the fact that the the pipeline is using the whole spectrum of data, it just turns out that usually cells that are um, different for a lot of things are it's not just you know a univariate difference right so as long as some information in the backbone reflects that split so that is klrg1 and st2 it'll do a pretty good job but if that's something you specifically care about um that type of originality that those subsets then you would want to design it into your backbone um and then you could ask questions about you know what else is expressed on those two different subsets so if a T reg looks like a T reg in your panel. If you only have, you know, Fox P, well, you can't really easily do Fox P3 in this context, but like say CD25, CD127 low, CD25 high, 127 low, something like that. Um, and that's where it stops. It may not pick that difference out. So um, that gets back to the uh, the fact that, you know, it's it's extensive and awesome data, but you still have to think about the biology and you still have to design a good panel to reflect that biology if you have those kind of specific questions. Okay, great. And uh, we still, have, there are a lot more questions coming in, so we're not gonna get through all these today, but uh, I started one or two minutes late, so if you're okay going one or two minutes past the top of the hour here, I will um, ask you just a couple more. Is that okay, Dr. Edley? Uh, yeah, I can go till 10.02. Okay, great. Uh, so, uh, question here from Kevin Gao. How did you define a mean standard error on a test data set for your model? Do you need to have a reference high parameter mass spec panel to confirm your model's accuracy? Yeah, so I can't do a really good job answering this one. I'm sorry. Uh, Etienne is really the, the math mind behind stuff and, and Raphael as well, um, but I will do my best. So uh, no, you do not need that reference panel. Uh, mass spec panel. Uh, the models are trained, so the way the pipelines is you, it's all sort of internal. So these are really data rich um, sets and you have empirical measurements of everything, right? So um, the way it functions is generally speaking, you take 50% of the cells um, from each well and you train your model on that. Um, and then you take the other 50% and you impute on that. So you you only ever get 50% of what you collected back out the other end of the pipeline. Um, that still ends up being a ton of data and, and plenty to, to work with. Um, <laughs> the aspect of do you need to validate the model on something else? So the way I look at it is, you know, no, you don't need to overtly for each experiment validate the model. Um, but you absolutely should do good science. And if you see something interesting, you should go in and double check it. The pipeline spits out 
FCS files that actually preserve the empirical measurement for each well. So you can actually go in and look at empirical versus imputed for stuff that looks interesting. Uh, it'd be labor intensive to do it all, but you can do it on the stuff that you're actually uh, pulling out and, and to, to understand. And then absolutely design follow-up experiments, repeat stains, design a panel incorporating that, uh, those new markers and look at them empirically. Because just like with uh, an RNA-seq experiment or anything like that, um, you always have to go back in and validate. That said, we've had very good luck doing that. So um, I can only think of a couple examples like that TCR spectra typing where the imputation is, has completely failed. Um, and that's for a very clear, you know, biologically reasonable uh, reason. So um, yeah, do good science, but it, 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 it works. Okay. Uh, so thank you so much. I think we are uh, two minutes past the hour. So um, I, I do want to end it there and just say thank you very much for um, everyone who attended and everyone who stuck with us right to the end here. We still have a couple, like 200 people on. I know there were at least a dozen more questions we didn't get to. We will uh, forward those on to Dr. Headley in an email version or to the people at Biolegend as well. And hopefully uh, one of the techs there or, or somebody on the team can um, get back to you with the answers to those questions. We wanna thank everybody again for attending and thank you so much, Dr. Headley, for sharing this content with everyone. And thank you to Biolegend for presenting it and and um, and, and sponsoring the whole the whole thing, so. Wonderful. Thank, thank you. Uh, it was fun. Great. We'll see you all next time.